All right, good afternoon. I'm Robert Sumwalt, and I'm the chairman of the NTSB, and thank you for being here. Um, our investigator in charge is uh, Dick Hipskin. Dick was uh, out in the field yesterday when we, when we got here, but Dick is running the investigation, assisted by the assistant investigator in charge, Jim Southworth. Uh, last night, right here in this very room at 6 o'clock, uh, we held our organizational meeting, and that is where the NTSB forms our organizational, uh, establishes our organizational protocols, and we designate parties to the NTSB's investigation. And uh, uh, the NTSB uh, typically designates parties to the investigation, those organizations that can provide technical assistance to the investigation. And we've designated uh, the following parties, the Federal Railroad Administration, uh, CSX, Amtrak, the Brotherhood of Railway Signalmen, Sheet Metal Air Rail Transportation Workers, which is known as SMART, uh, the Bro Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, which is BLAT, and the South Carolina Department of Transportation. Uh, the parties work hand in hand with the NTSB investigators uh, to, to, uh, in the collection of factual information. So that's what they'll be doing. So to recap, uh, Amtrak 91 originated in New York City on Penn Station and was, of course, en route to Miami, Florida. Yesterday we gave you figures for the number of occupants on board and uh, uh, figures like that are oftentimes preliminary, so let me give you the updated uh, account as we have it now. Amtrak had 139 passengers on board. It had eight crew members, which would consist of an engineer, a conductor, an assistant conductor, and five service personnel. Uh, today, of course, was the first full day of our investigative activities, and I'd like to report to you uh, some information that we've learned today. Uh, the recorders. We, the event data recorder from the Amtrak locomotive was recovered, and it was undamaged, and it, it has been successfully downloaded. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that the data that we're going to tell you now are preliminary data. Seven seconds before the end of the recording, the train horn was activated for three seconds. At that time, the speed was 56 miles per hour. And as we said yesterday, the allowable track speed was 59 miles per hour. Five seconds before the end of the recording, the brake pipe pressure began decreasing, which is an indication that the brakes are being applied. The throttle was then moved from full throttle to idle, and at that time the train speed was 54 miles per hour. Three seconds before the end of the recording, the emergency braking was initiated by an engineer-induced braking. There's a mushroom-shaped switch button on the console and that's how they put it into emergency engineer induced emergency braking. When the recording ended the train speed was 50 miles per hour and it resulted in a head-to-head -head collision between the two trains. I saw it reported in one of the media sources that it had hit the rear end of the CSX train but it was indeed a locomotive to locomotive um, strike and the uh, CSX train was moved back approximately 15 feet from its uh, original standing position. The Amtrak forward-facing video, as I mentioned to you yesterday, we recovered that, the hard drive, and sent it back to our recorder's lab in Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, we found that the recording actually ends a few seconds prior to the collision and so our engineers are attempting to recover, uh, forensically recover information from other ways that they may have. Uh, today we conducted four interviews. The CSX engineer, the CSX conductor, the CSX train dispatcher, and the CSX train master. And tomorrow we will be interviewing the surviving Amtrak crew. 
As far as the, the switch is concerned, and a lot of uh, uh, focus uh, on this switch that we talked about significantly yesterday, uh, we tested the, uh, the hand-thrown switch at uh, that switch right there, and we found no, except, no exceptions to the operation of that switch. Uh, as, as has been reported, uh, the signaling system uh, was inoperative due to signal upgrades for positive train control. And as, as I think we all know, the train, sig train system usually operates on wayside signals, signals that might be alongside the track. And that signal, in the signal system in this area was, uh, was inoperative due to track ma or signal maintenance, signal upgrades. And so when the signals are not operating, they're able to operate, trains typically are able to operate under track warrants whereby the, the dispatcher will authorize the train to operate in a certain territory. So that's usually how that's done. You're authorized to operate from this control point to this control point, and so that's the way they were operating on the, on the morning of the accident. Our investigators are beginning a a slow and deliberate removal of the rail equipment and the Amtrak locomotive has been removed to the uh, to a CSX facility uh, actually as I mentioned yesterday the uh, there's a automobile CSX auto facility right here where they load and unload automobiles and so the uh, the Amtrak locomotive was moved over to here as far as the track itself, uh, we have completed the track measurements and have established uh, the actual point of collision. There is nothing remarkable about the track. Uh, we are continuing the inspection and the documentation of the interior and the exterior of the rail cars, the Amtrak cars, and this will continue for several more days. Uh, I suspect our investigators will be here through the weekend uh, with their on-scene activities. As, uh, as always, follow us uh, for the latest update uh, on Twitter or our website. Twitter is our, our handle is in, at NTSB underscore newsroom or NTSB uh, or on the web at www.ntsb.gov. Um, a lot's been done today and a lot needs to be done, but I'm confident that our investigators will be able to piece this back together. As I've said before, we're here to f determine not only what happened, but why it happened. And it can oftentimes be a very exhaustive, uh, it, was, it is always a very exhaustive search and sometimes very time consuming. So in just a moment, I'll, uh, I'll call for uh, questions, but when I do, uh, when, when we do, do go to questions, if you'd kindly raise your hand, I'll call on you, state your name and your outlet. So at this time, we would glad to uh, take any questions. Chris, good morning, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Two questions for you. The, the switch, so that was a manually controlled switch that wasn't automatic. Somebody had flipped that and just didn't flip it back. So the question here is, was this switch uh, manually operated? That switch is always a manually operated switch. Um, so, uh, as I believe I mentioned yesterday, the uh, um, yesterday CSX brought uh, uh, some empty uh, cars from this facility. They brought it up to a siding up here, up to the north, and then back the train into here. In order to do that, of course, they would have to take the switch and move it so that it's no longer lined with the main track to be lined with the, with the siding. And so the position that we found it in yesterday was locked in a position that it would be lined to go into the siding. It literally had a padlock on it, locking it into that position. So, so we found it in the position that it was uh, left in. And if I can ask a broader question, uh, the NTSB has raised concerns in, in prior uh, reports uh, and recommendations about issues with Amtrak safety culture. We've now seen three fatal derailments from Amtrak in less than two months. At a certain point, does that become a pattern, not a series of accidents where you, you end up wondering what's going on at Amtrak? Well, the question is, are we looking, are we worried about, concerned about the, the culture? 
at Amtrak, and, uh, and I think it's very important that we have to look at each of these accidents in isolation to be able to determine uh, if there are um, uh, systemic issues. Like take last Wednesday, for example, it appears from that that there was a garbage truck on the track uh, and the Amtrak tra train ran into it. We're not sure what happened here. We, we do know the switch was left in a position that lined the Amtrak train to go into the siding. The expectation for the Amtrak crew would be that they're cleared all the way down through here. So we want to find out why this switch was uh, in this position. So um, uh, we, we, we do look at safety culture issues. We, uh, in October, we finished a report of Amtrak where we did point out safety culture issues involving a maintenance of way uh, related accident. But we, I think in order to say if there's a, a systemic issue, we've got to look you know, the one in Washington State on December the 18th, um, we've got to look at that one. We've got to look at the garbage truck on the railroad tracks. We've got to look at who, how that switch got left there. And then, then I think we can look and see if there's a systemic issue. There's a question over here. Um, you mentioned that you've been interviewing CSX employees, and I'm Andrew Brown with Post Courier. Um, how, is, is there any indication of how long that switch had been left into that locked position, which resulted in the accident. Is there any indication of how long that switch had been left in that position? So uh, we do not have that information right now to come up with the timeline, but we know in order to be able to back the train into there, it would have to be lined into that. So uh, we will, uh, as I mentioned, we have interviewed the, uh, the Amtrak crew today, and uh, uh, I do not have the information from those interviews, but uh, I think we can, we'll start piecing this thing together. It's a question right here. Uh, Gabe Gutierrez and NBC. Two questions, just to be clear. At this point, you say you're looking into it, but you're not ready to say that there is a systemic culture of like, safety issues at Amtrak. Are we willing to say that there's a systemic issue with Amtrak? Uh, no, we're not. We're not willing to look at that as it relates to this accident. We did find issues that's coming out of a maintenance of way uh, related accident back in the a few months ago, but as far as this is concerned, um, we're not willing to say that there's systemic issues. And the second question, you mentioned that the signal system was down because CSX was installing PQC? Uh, yeah, so why was the signal system down? Um, it's our understanding that they were performing up upgrades to the signal system uh, to get it ready for positive train control. It's a question right back here. Yes, ma'am. Fox. Um, Fox uh, out of Greenville. Uh, so the systems, were they, were they, were the signal, were they red, was the conductor, was Amtrak, was anybody in any type of communication with someone to kind of know, to be aware of the situation? Yeah, so was there anybody, was there any communications, I guess, between CSX and Amtrak uh, regarding this, these, these signals being inoperative? Is that, is that what you're asking? Yes. So um, in order to be able to operate without signals being operative, they would have to operate under this track warrant system whereby the engineer of this train knows that he or she is, is cleared to operate from this control point to this control point. So uh, the engineer would have known that they were operating under that system, and we are piecing together the timeline of, of everything that happened uh, in this event. And as I mentioned, we've interviewed the, AMP, the CSX dispatcher. We've interviewed the crews. We'll start piecing it all together. Yes, sir. David Curley from ABC News. Chairman, can you just give us a couple of details? You mentioned the seven seconds on the data recorder. Is that suggesting that he's gone through the switch? How long and what was the distance that the train traveled onto the siding before the collision? Was it all these times? Was it seven seconds that he had before he hit him? Uh, and then also the distance, if you can give us that. And then have you spoken just to CSX crew members? or have we spoken to CSX track workers who dealt with the switch? So, so that was about 17 different uh -huh. uh, questions so there. So, um, <laughs> so the first one, I'll go in reverse because I can remember better that way. So have we spoken to the CSX train crew? Rail crew, on the, on the rail line. On the rail line, the CSX crew that was standing here. No, the crew that was in charge of that switch. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, and that the, the person that would typically operate that as they back the train into here would be the, the crew of this train. Of the train train. That's correct. And you talked to all four of them? There's two. There's an engineer and a conductor, and we have interviewed them today. Um, so um, 
there were a lot of other questions up there, so pick your best one, and I'll try and answer well, that the one. the distance, how long, basically, how long did the Amtrak engineer distance or time from the time that he was switched off the main line <clears throat> until the collision? Well, um, so, so I'll ask uh, the investigator in charge from this switch, silica siding switch, <coughs> to the point of collision, what's the distance from that? 659 feet. 659 feet. Thank so you the, very much. So the seven seconds in the horn, the horn was before he was switched over, I guess, correct? At that speed? Well, I, I, we, we, we want to piece that all together as far as when the horn was activated, but I will say that an engineer, part of his duties, his or her duties, is as they're going down the track, is to look at these switch points to see which way this is lined. And if, a, if an engineer saw that a switch was lined for something other than it should be, um, they, should they should notice that. So because of the seven second horn and the five second brakes being applied, and then three seconds emergency braking, with only 659 feet at 55, six, seven, or eight, does that suggest that he saw something before the switch? I'm, I'm not willing to, um, to draw that analysis, but uh, you can do the math on that yourself. There's a question right here. Uh, Jonathan Heinley with Trains Magazine. Uh, what do we know about the Amfleet 2 Cafe car, car number four in the contest, that split into two when the other cars did not? So what do we know about the Cafe car that split into two when the other cars were not? I think that's part of our, our documentation process. And as I mentioned, that documentation process will, the documentation process will take a, a while. And then there, there becomes the analysis phase of that to understand how these cars, um, how the kinematics of it ended up moving the cars as they did. There's a car question back here. Mr. Fretwell. Yeah. Um, I'm Sandy Fretwell with the State Newspaper. <clears throat> I was curious to find out uh, if you can enlighten us on whether it seems obvious that one of the CSX employees made a mistake. So the question is, is it, is it are we saying that one of the CSX employees uh, made a mistake and and uh, no, we're not saying that. I will say that this switch was left, was, was positioned uh, as, uh, to line it for this siding. We want to understand exactly why that's the case. And I will say this, that, that it would be easy to latch on to the proximate cause and say this, this might be the error. But our investigations are very exhaustive, they're thorough, and we want to understand the underlying reasons for that. We want to look at the organizational culture. We want to look at the policies and procedures. So, so just because we might find that somebody made a mistake doesn't mean that's the end of the investigation. In fact, the way I look at that is that's just the beginning of the investigation. Okay, There's a qu question, question right here. Josh with the AP. Uh, the official policy, though, that you found is to switch the switch back to where it was? Was there anything out of policy that you found in the circumstances? So the, the policy, you're asking if the policy would be, after the CSX is back there trained into here, would the policy be to reline that switch for the main track? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, they had already, in fact, released their authority back to the dispatcher at that point. They had already said, we're through, which would indicate that they've done everything they need to do, including installing a device called a derail. A derail is, is put in place so that if a, if a train does go somewhere that it's not supposed to do, it's supposed to intentionally derail the train before a collision or something. And uh, of course, at this type of speed that we're talking about, um, a derail would not do much to prevent a collision. But uh, but, but, but yes, we, the procedure would be before releasing your track authority back, that switch should have been lined for the main track. So There's a question right here. Sorry, the dispatcher was under the impression it was lined straight? Well, the question is, was the dispatcher aligned that it was, uh, was, under, was he, under, he or she under the impression it was lined straight? Uh, we have interviewed uh, the dispatcher today, and I'll be curious to know what, what, what may have resulted from that. There's a final question here. Yeah, Tristan, so it's with CNN. Did uh, the CSX employee have any explanation as to why that switch was left in that? Did the CSX employee have any explanation for why the switch was left in that position? And, and I don't know the answer to that. We, uh, the interviews were conducted today, and it is our practice that we do not 
state what other people have said until all of the interviews have been conducted because we want to get everybody's individual perspective of what happened. So the answer is, I don't know. So well, thanks, well, thanks, if the signals had been working, what would that have looked like? Is there a roadmap system that tells these people where their switches would be? 